come in better. No. We're on. Hello? No. Yes, she's on. Yeah. Not going to work. I'll use the other one. Okay. Now you can hear me. <laughs> That's better because sometimes the voice wears out as well. Now, last weekend I, I worked too hard, and I did, and um, it's left me with varying pain down my hip, right down my leg. And for some reason or other, most times people with back injuries, <laughs> as you'd know, um, it doesn't ease it by sitting down. You're better up or lying down, but it just helps if I sit down to take the weight off it. So I'm going to do that. I hope you won't mind. So <clears throat> whenever I've <clears throat> studied to um, find material for a sermon, I most times end up coming back to the same topic. Now, a psychiatrist would probably tell you that, OK, if you're going to do that, you've maybe got a problem in that area. <laughs> um, but I don't believe that's the case in this case. It's because... In the, right throughout the whole of scriptures, the subject of salvation through Jesus is there. So it's very hard to avoid it. And uh, really, if you're going to present a doctrine of any sort, a teaching from the Bible, at the centre of it should be Jesus. So I don't feel quite so bad. I think of um, our dear old brother, Wilson Mutu, you remember him? What did he preach on? <laughs> Every time he came to Wong Rai, he and he admitted it, he preached on the second coming of Jesus. That was his topic. And that's what he always spoke about, the second coming of Jesus. And Paul said himself in the New Testament that he, he, was, he preached Christ and him crucified. So I don't feel so bad about going back to the same subject. What I, what I have to say is really quite simple, but because it's to do with the gospel, it's profound. And the amazing thing is that although the gospel message is so simple, quite often people get it wrong. We're coming and going a bit here, Trev. <laughs> Yeah, and so that's why I, I want to speak about it this morning. What I'm going to give you is just the bones, and uh, I know because of your, your knowledge that you'll be able to fill in the gaps in between. There's plenty of them, because the subject of salvation is very wide, very wide, and needs more than half an hour to discuss it. I want to start off this morning with asking you a question. What is, what is it that makes me good enough for heaven, to go to heaven? What is it that makes you good enough to go to heaven? Who, who wants to go to heaven? Is there anybody here who doesn't want to go to heaven? Well, that's good. I'm glad to see that. Everybody wants to go to heaven. So the question then is really quite pertinent for all of us although you may not have the problem that some do with, with that. What is it that makes me good enough to go to heaven? Now, most of the major religions throughout the world have developed systems alongside them to try and achieve holiness in their believers or for their believers to try to to reach holiness. 
they will do things to try and achieve that or to improve their standing or put themselves in a, in a better position in the afterlife. You take the Buddhists. I don't know what else they have, but one that comes to my mind is their prayer wheels, which are, I understand it, a means of trying to achieve holiness. The more prayers that they can turn around, the better off they are. And uh, they even, their, their um, temples have prayer wheels that are constantly blowing in the wind. The, the Hindus, I don't know what they achieve by it, but they want to bathe in the river Ganges or make a special trek to, to Mecca. And involved in that is the, the hope that some measure of holiness or some advantage will be gained by doing that. As we well know, in the militant Muslim community, they teach their children that to kill a Westerner guarantees you a place in heaven. And in Christianity, throughout the Dark Ages, it was encouraged for people to pay penance, to buy their way to heaven, to ensure uh, the transition of some loved one who's died from purgatory to heaven. And even great men like Luther were involved in penance, maybe not of quite the same type, but one that comes to my mind is the climbing of the stairs to the Sistine Chapel in Rome on your knees a painful experience to try and achieve holiness, to suppress the body and to um, encourage the spirit. And, um, yeah, fortunately, Luther eventually came to the realisation, as it says in Scripture, the just shall live by faith. And yet despite that, despite the fact that Luther taught that and Everybody in Christendom know, should, should know that. They still get things wrong. And they ask themselves the question, they torture themselves with the question, am I good enough for heaven? What makes me good enough for heaven? You remember the rich young ruler, I don't know whether he's young or not, um, if he was rich and he was young, he must have inherited it. But let's say the rich ruler, when he went to Jesus and asked, Good Master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, well, he said a number of things to him, but one thing that he said to him was, Sell what you have and give it to the poor. Unfortunately, the that man didn't do that. He had a lot and it filled his heart with sorrow to be parted from it. And so he walked away from Jesus and Jesus said it would be hard for people to go into the kingdom of God for rich people because they had more to lose. If that, the question that comes to my mind is, um, if that young man had done what Jesus said, it would appear that he'd be rewarded for what he had done on the surface that is and we won't go any further because you can bat me down on that one quite quickly but I think of the judgment scene that Jesus presented and let's have a look at it it's in um, Matthew 25 and verses 31 to 36 better I'll have a hand for you. Reading from verse 31 of Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, and hear the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Was it those acts of kindness that qualified the people for entrance into his kingdom? I don't think so. But on the surface, it looks like that. It looks like Jesus is teaching that because of those acts, they are guaranteed a place in the kingdom. You know, we do lots of good things. The, the, um, the group of singers, the simple voices, go and sing around to the old people in, in retirement homes. Does that qualify them for heaven? We've got people who go and provide breakfasts for for um, children at schools. Does that qualify them for heaven, those sort of good acts? Is that the sort of thing that makes us good enough for heaven? No, it's not. The question we really need to ask is not what makes me good enough for heaven is, but first of all, we need to ask, what does God require? What is his standard? What is his criteria for entrance into heaven? In Romans 14 and verse 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peter says in Second Peter 3 and verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And David, writing in the psalm, says, The righteous Lord loves righteousness. That's what heaven is about. Righteousness. That's what qualifies people for heaven. So where do we stand in the face of righteousness as the criteria for the entrance to heaven where do we stand the bible makes it quite plain isaiah says in chapter 64 and verse 6 we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags paul in romans 3 and verse 10 He's really reiterating what is in the Old Testament. There is none righteous, no, not one. And again in chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Am I good enough for heaven? Some people think that we can achieve our own holiness. But in the face of God's criteria for heaven, I see myself as the, those writers there have, as Paul has, and as Isaiah has. I fall far short of the righteousness that God wants to see. And Paul says it's no use trying to establish your own righteousness. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, speaking of the children of Israel, he says... For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So there's a, a righteousness of God as a standard for entrance to heaven. There's also a righteousness of God which God is prepared to work in our lives to achieve the standard he's looking for. 
the children of Israel di really didn't understand God's righteousness when they said, all that you say, we will do. Jesus said a similar thing when he told the story in, in Matthew 22, 2 to 14, of the man without the wedding garment. And I'd like to turn to that and have a look at that. I'll give you just a slightly different slant on it. Some of you will have heard me say this before, but it won't hurt being repeated. Matthew 22 and verses 2 to 14. And we won't read the whole lot. I'm just going to pick pieces out of it. You'll notice in verse 2, it says that the kingdom of heaven is like a certain man which made a marriage for his son. So it's about the kingdom of heaven that we're looking at here. And he sent out invitations to the people who were supposed to be at the wedding and they all went their separate ways. And so further invitations were sent out, calling everybody in, people from the highways and the byways, they were all called into the wedding. Back in those days, it was customary for, I gather it would have been the, the father of the, the groom, to provide wedding garments for the people. They weren't to come in their own clothes. They were to come in specially provided garments. You notice down in verse 11, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. I know the scriptures say that he didn't have a wedding garment on. But I'm sure it won't hurt to put just a slightly different twist on it here. Notice the man's reaction. He was speechless. And I believe that that man was in a wedding garment, all right. But it was one he'd provided himself. He'd probably gone to quite a lot of work, a lot of expense to make sure that he turned up at the wedding feast there in a good wedding garment. And even the people who were there at the wedding feast, they didn't complain about his presentation of himself. There's no mention of that. They considered him to be a good man and well presented. And it wasn't until the discerner of all hearts came in, the king came in, and he looked at the man and he saw he didn't have a wedding garment on, not the one provided. And the man was speechless because he thought he'd done a pretty good job. He thought he was a good man. But the king could see that there was a problem there. Back at the beginning, we asked ourselves, what is it that makes me good enough for heaven? <coughs> Jesus says in this story that it is wearing the right garment that makes me good enough for heaven. My garment is, is not good enough. It's the garment of Christ's righteousness that is needed for the passage through into heaven. I've always felt sl slightly offended by Frank Sinatra's rendering of that song, I Did It My Way. You'd know the song well. It's been played lots of times. And recently, recently I managed to purchase an album of Andre Rieu and his orchestra. And on there is a, an orchestral presentation of I Did It My Way. And it's absolutely beautiful. 
But in the end, I still felt that same revulsion because my way is never good enough. No matter how well I play the tune, my way is never good enough. It's no use in trying to make it in my own strength. How it's true, we may in this life, through the action of God's spirit that is, working in our lives, achieve lives that are devoid of sin or devoid of overt sinning. But we are never good enough in our own strength to stand before a righteous God. Isaiah says in chapter 61 and verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. That's what we need. That's what the man was lacking at the wedding feast. He thought he could get there in his garment, his good works. But no, what is required is Jesus' perfect robe of righteousness covering our sinfulness. Jeremiah says in chapter 23 and verse 6, speaking prophetically of Jesus, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 19, By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And again in Philippians 3 and verse 9, he says, That I may be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Really, we've been asking ourselves, and I've been doing it deliberately, been asking ourselves the wrong question all along because we can never be good enough for heaven it's not whether I'm good enough for heaven it's whether he is good enough for heaven I have a translation of the scriptures where it constantly talks about Jesus as being approved by the father and that's what we need we need to be approved. And the only way that that can be the case is if we accept the fact that we can never be good enough, but he is good enough and accept his righteousness, which he offers so readily to us. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, it is recorded that the angel said of Jesus, announcing his birth, his name shall be Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And you can repeat some of these verses with me. Here's another one. Jesus said of himself, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And here's another one, well known. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's another one. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not that I am good enough for heaven, but is he good enough? You know the the good news of the gospel is so very simple and so beautifully simple. And as Paul says, it brings a wonderful sense of freedom from trying to get to heaven in your own, in your own works. If I confess my sinfulness and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that his death on Calvary was for me and covers my sinfulness, I'm counted in heaven as righteous, as sinless. Not because I am good enough, but because he is good enough. If I should die shortly after such a confession of faith, I would find myself in place 
I find my place in the resurrection of the righteous. Not because I am good enough, but because he is. Even though my life had hardly had a chance to change, I would be there. Take the thief on the cross. <coughs> Jesus' words to him were, I can tell you right now, you will be in paradise. Certainly not because the, thought the thief was good enough. After all, he was about to die because of his crimes. But Jesus was good enough. And that makes the difference. Then why does Jesus say what he does to the sheep on his right hand in that judgment scene? They almost seem to be rewarded for what they have done. But are they? Remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples just before he died, he said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If God is living in us, it makes a difference to how we think, what we say, how we react, every aspect of our life changes if he is dwelling in us it changes our lives completely those people the, the sheep on Jesus right hand weren't being rewarded for what they had done but their good acts were evidence that they had accepted salvation through Jesus and were allowing the Holy Spirit to work in their lives here's a few words I've, I've taken them from next quarter's lesson. If we abide in the Lord and allow him to abide in us through his spirit, we will be changed even radically. I'll read that again. If we abide in the Lord and allow him to abide in us through his spirit, we will be changed even radically. Paul put it this way. He said, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. God does look for a change in us. That's why he was constantly calling to the children of Israel to give them his heart, uh, give him their hearts. He constantly called for that. I learned something interesting the other day. You know, I'm getting toward the latter part of my life, but I learned something about the beginning of life <laughs> the other day. Um, in the embryo, the heart is formed before the brain. I would have thought that the brain would be required to make the heart beat. But in the embryo, the heart is formed first and is beating before the brain is formed. The heart has its own supply of, I think the word is neurons. That's sort of like electrical connections. The heart has its own supply of neurons. It's not dependent on the brain. It is not dependent here yeah, on the brain. There are more neuron connections from the heart to the brain than from the brain to the heart. The heart is, the, is actually the centre of our being. And maybe that's why God constantly looked for people to give their heart to him so that he could work in them. He said we, we must be born again. You know, a heart transplant makes a difference. Sometimes a person is totally physically unable to do anything, but they get a heart transplant and all of a sudden they can do things they could do when they were much younger. It does make a difference. Remember Jesus said to his disciples, as I said before, if a man love me and keep my words, my father will love him and we will come in and dwell in him. And uh, yeah, that will make a big difference. I've made a list here. It's interesting. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. A list of some of the things that Jesus looked to see in us. 
These are his words he was talking there about there, if we keep his words. In the Sermon on the Mount, he calls upon us to salt the earth with our life. In other words, our lives should be making everybody else's lives much more savoury for them because we are there and we are communicating with them. We're making their lives better and easier. He said, light the world, let your light shine. He said, be straightforward in your speech. You can take that in all sorts of ways. He said, be forgiving. Be generous. If somebody asks you for your shirt, give them your jacket as well. If somebody says, go two miles, go four. Be generous. Love your enemies. No grudges. Heap coals of fire on their head. Be a blessing to others. Do go to, do go to those who hate you, or do good to those who hate you. You know, it's not an easy thing to do, but that's what he said. Pray for those who persecute you. Be the children of your father. You know, we look for our children to represent us aright, and we feel let down. If, if they don't sometimes, or we feel they don't. And often our Father in Heaven must feel quite badly about our representation of Him. But He calls for us to be the children of your Father. And you know what is meant by that. Be mature in your actions. It says be perfect like your Father in Heaven. But that word there is mature. Be mature in your actions, in your thoughts, in your responses as, as your father. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and follow Jesus. That's not all the things that Jesus asked us to do, but those are some of the, the good things he's wanting to see in our lives. So there's plenty of room for growth there. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, others will see those things appearing in, in our lives. But remember one thing. Even when God has worked all these changes in our lives, it will be none of these things that will qualify us for heaven. It's never, am I good enough for heaven? But is Jesus good enough? I've chosen hymn number... Oh, I've forgotten the number. That doesn't matter. It'll come up on the screen. I like the words in it. I particularly like it because if I didn't get things right in my presentation to you this morning, the hymn would tell it all. Okay. Here's what it says. Because often when we're singing songs, we don't get the words quite as readily. My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to him. He will not cast me out. My soul is resting on his word the living word of God, salvation in my Saviour's name, salvation through his blood. The great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. The chorus says, I need no other evidence, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Let's stand to sing together.